The Holy Gospel for the day is taken from the 17th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. Jesus said, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, so that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray for the blessing of the Spirit. Settle over us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit, that in these words you would speak to us, to our hearts and souls, and your presence would transform us. Amen. A couple of months ago, the Lutheran magazine ran a cartoon. It depicted God with the the world on a pedestal, and it was still kind of drippy and wet looking. And God says to the angel, I've been working on this thing 24 6. (laughs) Pretty good, right? Morgan Murray, however, describes the creation in this way He said, God created the heaven and the earth, and then God created Adam and Eve. And God was pleased. And God, the very first thing that God said after that was, don't. Adam said, don't what? God said, don't eat from the forbidden fruit. And Adam said, we got forbidden fruit? And then he yells at at Eve, Eve, we got forbidden fruit. Eve says, no way. Adam says, yes way. God says, just don't eat from the fruit. Adam says, why? God says, because I'm your father, and I said so. Even as God was thinking, I should have just stopped after I made the elephants. (laughs) A little while later, God looks down and sees the kids having an apple break and is very angry. And God says to them, "Did did I not tell you that you were not to eat of the forbidden fruit? And Adam says, yes, you told us. And God said, well, then why did you do it? And Eve said, I don't know. And Adam said, it's her fault. She started it. And Eve said, is not. And he said, is too. And she said, is not. And God was so aggravated at the two of them and so done with them that God's punishment was that they would have children themselves. (laughs) And that started the trend which has never been changed to this day. In the gospel reading for today, Jesus says, I pray on behalf of those who will know me because of their word. This is part of his last prayer. We pay attention because it has as its essence a sort of last will and testament. He prays it just before he is about to be arrested and sent off and executed. This powerful prayer is a very, very long prayer. Just before this, Jesus was praying that God would protect his followers. Now in this, God, Jesus expands the list of people who are being prayed for. Now he is praying that God would protect on behalf of those who will become believers. In effect, Jesus is praying for us, every last one of us, and for every person in all of history who has ever been a believer. And then the fascinating thing in the prayer is that it doesn't just stop with us. Jesus doesn't just pray for believers. Jesus prays for everyone. He says, in order that the world might know. In the New Testament, 
world is an equal sign to those who are against God. World was the language that was used to describe anyone who was not on God's side. We could today imagine that as being an enemy of God. And so Jesus expands this, and what he expands it into is something incredibly powerful, because he wants the world to know that God loves them with the same kind of love that God has for him. It's a very powerful thing. It means that God's love is not just for those of us who are believers. It means that God's love is not just for those of us who get it right, who live a perfect life. In fact, it is for us in our brokenness and in our sinfulness, and it is for a broken and sinful world even in the midst of its hostility to God, even while it still has not come to understand who God is and why God is at work. So it dawned on me this week as I was looking at these texts that the story, this powerful story that we hear in the Acts, the book of Acts, is a really good example of what it looks like on the ground when the people of God own and believe that God does in fact love the world in a way that is beyond imagining. So the story is told by Luke, who's the author of the book of Acts, that Paul and Cyrus met a slave girl who had the gift of divination. Divination was predicting the future. And in fact, Luke tells us the name of this spirit. It is called a python spirit. That's not throwaway stuff. A python spirit was well known and specific, and it was in fact a spirit which was associated with and guarded and protected by the Roman gods. So that what we know about the spirit of divination for this young lady is that her predictions are really the falsity of idolatry. And she seems to have a great fascination for them. Every time she sees them, she calls out, these men are slaves to the Most High God. That also is a much more important thing than you might imagine. Because when a spirit in the New Testament is the first to recognize someone is connected to the Most High God, they are demonic spirits. Remember in the Gospels, every time Jesus is around, some demon is saying, look, that's the Son of God. They get it. And that's a powerful thing for us to remember because the problem with evil is not that it doesn't know God. The problem with Satan, Satan knows God. Satan knows God's power, but Satan doesn't want to allow himself to love God and doesn't want God to be authority in his life. And the fact of the matter is the more we walk on that ledge as we skirt away from God and as we allow God less and less authority in our lives, the closer we are getting to the forces of evil in our world. Well, Paul and Silas know this, that they're not just dealing with any ordinary thing. What she has, this prediction that she gives, is more than just a sign of idolatry. It's also demonic. And so Paul determines to cast away this spirit of the python using the name of Jesus. Paul invokes the name of Jesus and casts out the evil spirit. And that's because we can't fight evil on our own. Even Paul doesn't determine to handle evil alone, but calls upon the Lord. And so also it is with us. Now, when, G- when Paul frees G- um, this girl through the words of Jesus, through the name of Jesus, It evokes a lot of emotions. There's awe and curiosity and fear. And on the part of her owners, there is anger because she's been making them a whole lot of money. You know, anybody who can really predict the future, that's a pretty big money maker. And so she, they have lost their meal ticket. They, they didn't really care about whether or not she was normal. And it reminds us that not everyone rejoices when good people do good things, and not everyone rejoices when other people are set free. It is the nature of our world, is it not? And in fact, they were so angry that they dragged Paul and Silas before the magistrate, charging them with being Jewish and inciting something illegal. 
Now, magistrates were the two most important people in the city. They were in all the Roman colonies, and their job was to make judgments and mete out punishment. And these two did a great job with that. They had Paul and Silas severely beaten and thrown into prison. Now, this time in prison is way worse than you might imagine. You have to know something about first century thought to know that because they get placed in the inner cell. The inner cell was the place where you put the worst criminals and also the place where you put the most lowly people. It was a place designed to demoralize and humiliate the prisoners who were assigned to the inner cell. And not only that, the foot uh, guard or the foot stock that they get placed into was a terrible thing. It was a very long iron comb, if you will, with lots of space between the teeth. The comb was fastened to the floor. A man's feet or legs were shoved down into the space between the combs, and then a bar was laid across as tight as it could over the legs and fastened. And it meant that you couldn't even move to resettle yourself so that you wouldn't be un so uncomfortable. And the only way you could sleep was to just lay yourself down on the floor. The inner cell was not just a place of security, it was a place of torture. And in spite of that, Paul and Silas spend their time singing hymns and praying and witnessing to Christ. The first thing that we do, if we want the world to see God's love for a broken world, is we remember that the source of our joy is in knowing God, and that is true whatever the circumstances of our lives might be. So then comes the earthquake. Interesting thing, not because it's an earthquake. You know that region of the world has always had lots of earthquakes. And in fact, in first century, there's more evidence of earthquakes than there is even yet today. It's still a very active area. What's startling about it is both its timing and its effect. Because after the earthquake, which occurs in the middle of the night, the prison doors are opened and the leg stocks are set free. Now, of course, when the jailer awakes, he thinks that Paul and Silas have escaped. Everyone else would have been gone, for sure. And so he takes out his sword to kill himself, because better a quick suicide than what they would do to him if they caught him having lost the inner cell subjects. And so he stands ready to kill himself, and Paul and Silas call out, don't take your life, we're still here. You see, they didn't escape because their plan was to witness. And it reminds us of the second part of how we prove to a world that God actually genuinely loves them, and it has to do with our willingness to put aside our self-interest for the sake of another. And so as this unfolds, the jailer is impressed. He's moved. And perhaps he's also heard the witnessing that's been going on overnight. But in effect, he becomes a believer. And he takes Paul and Cyrus to, Silas to his home. He cleans them up, gives them a meal. It's a wonderful experience, and all of his family is baptized. It is the willingness of Paul and Silas to do what they did that brings him to the faith. The next day, however, is the day in which the most important thing happens. And that is that on the next day, Paul and Silas reveal that they are Roman citizens. And Roman law was very profound. You could not do those kinds of things that were done to Paul and Silas under Roman law. A Roman citizen does not get that rough treatment. And so the magistrates would have been in big trouble, and they also would have been punished. The interesting thing about all of this is that Paul and Silas could have stopped the whole process in the beginning simply by saying that they were Roman citizens, but they didn't because they wanted to use an opportunity to witness. Do you see the self-sacrifice they made? A willingness to suffer is what brought the jailer to his relationship with Christ, a willingness to suffer for the sake of the world, is what helps our world recognize the truth of the matter when God says, and I love also you, even as you are broken. My cousin Ralph was two weeks to the day older than I was. 
His brother was three years older than us, and my brother was two years younger than us. When I was a girl, we used to play together all the time, especially in the summer times. And you can imagine, between the four of us, there wasn't very much we couldn't think of to do. And a lot of it was getting us in trouble with some great regularity. Well, one afternoon, when I was probably about seven, my, my mother and Ralph's mother were together working up chickens to go into the freezer, and we children were playing, and somebody in the group had the idea that we should climb up into the old barn loft. Now, the old barn loft was forbidden territory, mostly because it was really falling down. It wasn't very safe, but also because they stored a lot of sharp, dangerous old stuff in there. But, you know, there's some kind of an allure, isn't there, to the sort of forbidden fruit stuff? And so the four of us decided we'd go play in the barn loft, which we did. Now, the barn loft had this flat ladder that was attached to the wall, and you'd climb up, and when you got to the very top step, there was about a distance, the length of my legs, that you had to kind of lift your leg over and pull yourself in and drop a couple feet to the floor, and we all got up there with no problem. And finally, after about an hour, we decided we'd better get back and check in or we'd all be in trouble. And so Bobby lifted my brother Stephen over onto the ladder, and down he went. Bobby went down, Ralph went down, but I was stuck. Now, when I say stuck, what I actually mean was I was paralyzed. I looked down, and I saw all that sharp-looking junk there at the bottom of a long drop, and I thought, there is no way I'm going to get down these steps. Well, the cousins sort of tried to coerce me into going down, you know, a little bit of, you're just a girl and all that kind of stuff. But I was not being talked down. There's just no way I was going to be talked down from the loft. And so finally, in exasperation, the boys run to the mothers, my little brother shouting the whole way, call the fire department, call the fire department, Vicky's stuck in the loft. I was stuck in the loft. I can't describe for you the trepidation and relief it was to see my mother standing at the bottom of those steps. I knew I was in big trouble, but who cares? Because I also knew that in just a matter of minutes, I was going to be safe. She also tried to talk me down, but like I said, there was no talking me out of that loft. No way in the world. So finally, she climbed up, had me put my arms around her neck, And then she lifted me over and brought me down. And I have to tell you, that's the first time I remember believing and knowing that when someone loves you, you are safe. And that salvation comes as a gift of love. That's all I really knew about it until I was in my 30s, and one day we were talking about it, Mother and I. And she told me then that she also has... Um, not so much fondness for heights, and it was a real problem for her to go up those steps to get me. She said she was only able to do it because her love for me was greater than her fear for herself. That is salvific love. That's what it means to love and to put yourself out and to be willing to suffer for the sake of another. So yes, you know, God may have made Adam and Eve, and it may have looked like children were punishment for the misbehaviors of Adam and Eve, but really they aren't punishment because God has never wavered in loving them. Every last one of us, children of a broken humanity, is loved by God. And that includes all the way up to and including Jesus coming to die for us and sending this entire cadre of witnesses generation upon generation, beginning with Paul, right up to the person who was most influential in your own life, for which I pray you will be thanking God right now. Because when we learn to love others as God loves them, the world really does get better, one person at a time.